Well, good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm so grateful and honored by the invitation. Um, my name is David Dodick. I'm actually from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Uh, grew up in Cape Breton, went to Dalhousie University for my undergraduate in medical school, so I'm a Canadian. Um, I came to Minnesota uh, quite a while ago now, 30 years ago, to do my neurology residency. I went back to University of Toronto, did a fellowship and have been at the Mayo Clinic practicing ever since. I direct the headache program here as well as the concussion program. And um, I'm, it's unfortunate I couldn't hear what Dr. Becker was saying because you know I couldn't think of too many people on the planet I'd rather be uh, sharing this session with than Dr. Becker. I've been um, a longtime friend and, and colleague of Dr. Becker's. We've worked together closely over uh, almost 25 years actually. So. Uh, I'm honored to be here with, with Dr. Becker. The title of my presentation today is Migraine Circa 2020, uh, a gold rush for treatments and a heyday for patients. I say that for, for a number of reasons, which I'll get to in my lecture, but it's really been a remarkable two years or two and a half years now, uh, unprecedented in the field actually. I've been in this field for 25 years now, a little more than 25 years. And never before have we seen the kind of unprecedented explosion of th new therapies uh, that we've seen over the past two and a half years. So that's the reason I I've entitled to talk this. You know, as an aside, I've always wanted to go to Banff and Lake Louise. There are very few areas in Canada I haven't been. Banff and Lake Louise was, happened to be one of them. So it, it actually kills me now that I can't, I can't be there in person. Now, if I can just uh, advance the slide, that would be great. There we go. So this is my disclosure statement, and I've highlighted what's relevant here. I'm going to be talking about the new monoclonal antibodies and the new drugs uh, that have emerged over the past couple of years for migraine. And I've consulted with the companies who have manufactured and developed these drugs. And, and my, the nature of that consulting has been to help design the clinical trials, help analyze and interpret the data, and in some instances, helped uh, with the publication. So... The reason why it's been a heyday for patients is the explosion of new therapies. We've had eight drugs uh, against four different targets over the past two years. By any measure in any neurological disease or any disease for that matter, to have eight new therapies within a two-year period uh, attacking four different targets um, is a remarkable uh, advance. So as you know, we have now a number of antibodies, four antibodies that target calcitonin gene-related peptide, Either the, either the peptide itself or the receptor. We have a number of small molecule oral drugs that are antagonists at the CGRP receptor. We have lesmitidam, which is a 5-HT1F receptor agonist. So it's a selective serotonin 1F receptor agonist. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about each of these. And we have a PACAP38 antibody, the monoclonal antibody that targets PACAP38. It's not available yet, <clears throat> but it is a, a high value target. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the next 30 minutes. So the question is, well, how did we get here? <clears throat> how did we get to a point in time where we've had this um, explosion in new therapies? It really goes back into the mid 1980s when Lars Edmondson, who is a, a scientist in, in Sweden, was working on the cerebral circulation and he was constricting, chemically constricting cerebral blood vessels. And you can see here, this is a, a, an illustration of, a, of what happens after a cerebral blood vessel is constricted. You can see in the blue here, uh, the return to normal caliber within a, a relatively short period of time. If you section the trigeminal nerve, just cut the trigeminal nerve, you see that there is quite a delay in the recovery of normal vasomotor tone. And of course, the peptide that they then discovered that is responsible for this vasodilation is calcitonin gene-related peptide. It's located in trigeminal sensory nerves, and when released, it dilates cerebral blood vessels. And it's responsible for not only dilation, but restoring normal vasomotor tone. And so way back in the 80s, because migraine, was thought, migraine headache was thought to be due to abnormal dilation or distension of blood vessels, the speculation was that CGRP may be of considerable importance, not only in the regulation of cerebral blood flow, but also in migraine. So that's when the speculation first happened that CGRP plays a role in migraine. Now we know uh, 25, 30 years later that CGRP is actually released 
during migraine attacks when you measure it in venous blood. When you infuse CGRP into people with migraine, you will reproducibly and relatively reliably trigger an attack of migraine that's usually indistinguishable from a spontaneous attack. And we now know from preclinical models, when you stimulate, of course, the trigeminal sensory system, there's release of CGRP. And as I've said, there's release during a migraine attack. And when you give sumatriptan, for example, or imitrex uh, during a migraine attack, it normalizes those elevated CGRP levels. So there was a, a significant amount of circumstantial evidence, uh, both preclinical and clinical, to suggest that CGRP is playing a very prominent role in migraine. One of the good things about blocking the CGRP-induced vasodilation is that it does so without vasal constriction, so that the receptor antagonists that I'm talking about and the, and the monoclonal antibodies, they prevent dilation of, of the vessel in response to CGRP infusion, but they do not directly constrict the vessel, unlike current uh, acute migraine medicines. And they appear to modulate sensory signaling within the trigeminal sensory fibers. So just like when triptans were developed. They were developed in an effort to find a drug or, or a series of drugs that actually constricted cerebral blood vessels. We now know that that's probably not the way they work. They work by actually inhibiting trigeminal sensory fibers. Um, similarly here, these drugs were developed with the idea that they would block this abnormal vasodilation, but it now appears that they actually modulate sensory signaling. And some very recent work that's been published actually shows where these drugs and antibodies probably work, at least one site of action. Because the antibodies are such large molecules, they don't appreciably cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's thought that these probably work mostly peripherally. And it's been recently identified that CGRP in a trigeminal sensory fiber, CGRP is actually contained in C fibers and it's released from C fibers, as you see right here. So you see CGRP being released from vesicles in the C fiber itself, whereas the receptor for CGRP is located on A delta fibers, um, as you can see here. And interestingly enough, these CGRP receptors appear to be clustered at the nodes of Ranvier, which, as you know, is where saltatory conduction occurs. So it appears that by blocking the receptor or by attaching and blocking the peptide, you can block sensory signaling and the propagation of sensory signals by blocking um, CGRP-induced signaling at the nodes of Ranvier. So that we're, st we're starting to understand now exactly um, at least one site of where these drugs act. Recently, in fact, less than two weeks ago, actually, a new paper was published uh, in neurology from Arne May's group in Germany, actually showing that there may be a central effect of these antibodies as well. At least there's, well, there is a central effect, whether they get into the central nervous system is unclear. Certainly if you measure in the CSF in animals or in humans, you do see some level of antibody, maybe 0.1% or less than 1% of what you see in serum. So there is antibody that does cross. And of course there are areas of the brain that are not protected blood, but by the blood brain barrier. So it's still somewhat controversial as to whether these drugs get in at a sufficient uh, dose or, uh, or sufficient dose to be able to exert a central effect. But what this, what this group showed is that there is deactivation at the level of the hypothalamus in patients who respond compared to those who don't respond. For those of you who may not be aware, the hypothalamus has in the past two, two and a half years been shown to be the area in the brain that's activated first during the prodromal phase of a migraine attack. So we used to talk about the brainstem being a migraine generator. More likely now it's an area within the hypothalamus. And interestingly enough, in patients who are responding, in this case to arenumab, the antibody that was studied, there is deactivation of that hypothalamus in patients who are responders, as opposed to non-responders where there's continued hypothalamic activation. So these drugs appear to work peripherally and whether it's just driving traffic down and, and having a modulatory effect on what's happening centrally, or whether it's, there's a dual action where some of it gets crossed the blood brain barrier or accesses the blood brain uh, or the brain in areas where there's no blood brain barrier. So there's a dual mechanism of action peripherally or centrally, we're not quite sure yet.
The drugs that have been developed for that target CGRP are obviously antibodies, biologics, and small molecules, otherwise known as GPANs. Obviously, there's a huge difference in, difference in size. The anti, there's a difference in specificity. The antibodies are highly specific. There's a difference in the way these drugs are cleared from the body, of course. These biologics, these antibodies are proteins, so they're broken down in the reticuloendothelial system by peptidases uh, or enzymes, uh, much like other proteins in the body. So they're not metabolized by the liver, which is good because there should be little to no drug-drug interactions. Because of their size and because of their proteins, they have to be administered parenterally, um, subcutaneously or intravenously. They mostly don't cross the blood-brain barrier, and we've had that discussion. The half-life is very long, so they last about a month, which allows them to be administered either on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis and they may pr provoke an immune response, unlike small drugs. Now, there have been a variety of studies showing that neutralizing antibodies are, are produced at extremely small uh, rate to these monoclonal antibodies, and most of the time they appear to be transient. So there's no data yet to suggest that those people who develop neutralizing antibodies, which happens to be a very small group, does it impact on the efficacy or tolerability? So there are four antibodies that have been developed now, and I, obviously I could spend three hours just going over all of the data that's been accumulated over the past five years. But suffice it to say, and I'm summarizing all four antibodies here. So we have Arenumab, which, was, which is approved in Canada. I think it was the first antibody approved. That's a subcutaneous antibody. We have Galcanezumab. We have Fremenezumab, which are also subcutaneous antibodies. They're delivered once a month, although Fremenezumab can be delivered once every three months. And eptinizumab is one that's recently been approved here in the United States about four months ago. And it's delivered intravenously every three months. So there's three, there's four MABs, three that target the receptor, or three that target the peptide, one, arenumab, that targets the receptor, three that are delivered subcutaneously, and one, eptinizumab, which is delivered intravenously. So I'm showing you, you here each of the antibodies and the response rates, or the proportion of patients who have a greater than 50% reduction in the mean, lump, mean number of migraine days. This is episodic migraine. So between 43 and 62%, depending on the study, depending on the dose, depending on the antibody, will have a 50% reduction or more in the monthly migraine days. If you look at 75% reduction, so what proportion of patients will actually have a greater than 75% reduction? That means 75 to 100%, about a third. You can see it's relatively consistent across trials, anywhere from 31 to 39%. So about a third have a 76 to a 100% to reduction, uh, which is pretty robust. And then for chronic migraine, the response rates are a little bit lower. Um, not surprisingly, these patients are traditionally, historically more difficult to, to treat but anywhere between 28 and 55% have a greater than 50% reduction in mean monthly migraine days, which is often the primary endpoint that's used in these trials. So response rates look relatively robust uh, with this group of medications or biologics. From a side effect standpoint, and I'm now quoting data from two different meta-analyses that looked at efficacy and tolerability of the antibodies. So overall, with respect to overall adverse events and with respect to serious adverse events, there was no difference with any of these antibodies compared to placebo. So that's good. The other thing we'd like to look at is what proportion of patients actually withdrew from the study due to adverse events? And it was about two and a half percent or less in, in, in most studies. But on average, it was around two and a half percent. And that also didn't differ when compared to placebo. In the product, for the product information or the FDA label, the caution for each of these antibodies when they were released was a hypersensitivity allergic immune reaction that could occur, in some cases anaphylaxis. So that was the caution. There were no contraindications, but that, that was the caution. And of course, in anybody who demonstrated hypersensitivity, that became a contraindication. The only side effect really <clears throat> that was mentioned in the label was constipation for arenumab and some injection site reactions that could occur with all of the antibodies. So the take home message is that by and large, these antibodies appeared to be very favorably tolerated, at least in clinical trials. So now that we've had two and a half years of experience, um, I'm going to share with you now a lot of post hoc analyses that have been done as well as our own experience and the experience from other 
um, experts around the world. So what can patients expect? Patients can expect similar effectiveness and similar effectiveness even if they failed other preventive treatments. So in post-hoc analyses, looking at patients who have failed two to four previous preventive treatments, these drugs appear to, to, to uh, perform well. And in our, ser our series that we published, patients fail on average 11 prior preventive medications because we're a very tertiary referral center. And yet our response rates were around 55 to 60%. So even in a very treatment refractory patient population, who have failed multiple preventive medications, who have been overusing acute medicines, and who have significant comorbidity that would have excluded them from clinical trials, like chronic pain syndromes and severe fibromyalgia and major depression, um, even in those patients, we can see similar effectiveness. The onset can be fast. So normally when we're starting these old oral medications, you know, we normally start at a low dose and we titrate slowly and we wait two to three months to see if there's an effect. The onset here can be seen within one day if you're using the intravenous antibody. In fact, the intravenous antibody has been shown to be effective now, not published data, but effective in a study looking at it as an acute treatment. But these antibodies can be effective within a day or up to a week. Nevertheless, there can be a delayed onset for some of these antibodies and a cumulative benefit over time. But what we can tell patients is that many people start to see an effect within, within the first week. One bonus is that they can be used safely and effectively with other preventive treatments. So we don't have to pull people off of medications that they're on, including botulinum toxin, if they happen to have chronic migraine. We can simply add this treatment just to see if it augments or amplifies the preventive effect that patients can get. And we don't have to worry really about drug-drug interactions. <clears throat> we can switch successfully if one isn't effective or tolerated. Now, we don't know that from clinical trials, and we wondered whether you could, if a patient's not responding to or not tolerating one antibody, could we switch to another one? If they're on a receptor-targeted antibody, could we switch to a peptide-targeted antibody or even switch within the group of peptide-targeted antibodies? It certainly seems, based on a cumulative clinical experience now, that that is the, the, that it, that is the case that we can successfully switch someone if they've not responded to or tolerated a previous med, a biologic here. The effectiveness increases over time. Not surprisingly, we see this with all preventive medications. For patients who are responding and who are adhering and who take the medication for a longer period of time, this is data from uh, the Arenumab because it's been around the longest. Uh, this is five-year data now. So if you look at the proportion of patients who had a greater than 50% reduction, you know, I shared with you the recent data here from clinical trials showing 42 to 62 percent. So here, almost 70 percent had a greater than 50 percent reduction, and almost half had a greater than 75 percent reduction. Now, granted, this is a biased selection of patients who are tolerating the drug and seem to be responding to the drug. But what I'm show demonstrating here is that the longer people stay on drug, the higher these response rates get over time. However, also, what patients can expect are new side effects that weren't seen in the clinical trials and a higher rate of side effects that did occur in clinical trials. So many investigators and many clinicians now have seen new side effects pop up like dizziness, fatigue, cramps, joint pain, fatigue, sometimes more headache or more migraine, nausea and alopecia. And there's a higher rate of known side effects. So I said that constipation was present in the arenumab label. It occurred in about one to 3% in the clinical trials. In clinical practice, it occurs more commonly, between 13 and 43%. Not necessarily, um, it doesn't preclude the continuation of the antibody in the majority of patients, but it certainly occurs at a higher rate. Now, I do need to tell you that since the release of arenumab, the FDA has updated the label for this uh, medication. Specifically res with respect to anaphylaxis, there have been some cases of anaphylaxis. There have been some cases of hypertension. Um, hypertension either in patients who never had a history of hypertension, so de novo, or an exacerbation of hypertension. The majority of them occur within the first week, and the majority occur within after the first dose. So it, if you're going to look for, if you're starting a patient on one of these antibodies, because I don't know if there's a class effect yet, but I would do this with all of them. In a patient who already has hypertension, I'd be watching for hypertension within the first couple of weeks after the first dose. And then severe constipation. 
There have been uh, some cases where patients needed to be hospitalized and in some cases actually required surgical intervention. So in terms of the updated label, we've seen some hypertension, even though we did not see that in clinical trials. Uh, we've seen it in practice, although I haven't seen it myself personally, but obviously it's occurred and severe constipation. The benefit weight may, may wear off over time. That's something else we've noticed. So before the next dose, remember these can be either be given quarterly if it's intravenous or if it's feminizumab or monthly if it's, if it's any one of the other antibodies. And we have seen patients wear off so they get more migraine attacks in the days to week before the next dose in some patients. And some of us have actually noticed a loss of treatment effect over time or tachyphylaxis, if you will. That remains to be seen whether that's real or whether patients are just having a bad month or two. But we have seen a loss of treatment effect in some patients. This doesn't happen very often, but it, it seems to happen in some. We can't predict who's going to respond. We don't have a biomarker or there isn't a clinical characteristic that tells us who's going to respond or who's going to have adverse events, unfortunately. But that's the case with everything we use, unfortunately. It's not precision medicine yet. And there are some pure non-responders. To all of them, I've had patients who fail to respond to all of these antibodies delivered subcutaneously and intravenously. So just like that we have some patients who are pure responders, you know, the patient who in, after the first injection never has another migraine attack for two years, we also see some patients who are pure non-responders. And that in our, in our clinical experience, about a third of the patients uh, discontinue the medication either because of a lack of efficacy or because of tolerability. And of course, one has to make a comment here about pregnancy. We don't know whether these are safe during pregnancy. And because of the half-life of a month, that's a benefit in terms of not having to dose very often, but it's a limitation when you have a patient demographic that's largely young women of childbearing age. So if women are planning a pregnancy, um, then they, they really do have to be off the drug, we estimate, for about five months before trying to conceive. So that's important a conversation to be having with the patient. I want to make a few comments now about GPANS, and I know Dr. Becker is going to be talking about uh, new acute drugs later on, uh, but I don't know that some of you may not be able to attend that. So I just wanted to make a few comments about the small molecules now. So we talked about the antibodies. There are four small molecules in development that target the CGRP receptor. I'll talk about three of them, two of which have been FDA approved for acute treatment. That's for Medjapant and Ubrojapant. And one of which is now uh, being considered as a preventive treatment. It's now had two phase three trials, which were positive. So Ubrojapant is now approved for the acute treatment of migraine. Again, these are CGRP receptor antagonists. They do not constrict blood vessels. So there's no cardiovascular contraindication per se. The clinical data looked about 20% of patients were pain-free at two hours. That's the regulatory endpoint. And about 60% of patients had relief at two hours. Now, if you look at the triptans development over the last you know, 25 years, the principal primary endpoint was headache relief. It's only over the past five to 10 years that we started to use pain-free as the endpoint. But if you look at these relief rates of 60% or so, that's generally what we see with the triptans. Subsequently now in open label studies, when you treat while pain is mild, you know, in clinical trials for acute migraine drugs, patients are required to wait until the pain is at least moderate intensity or severe, instead of what we recommend in practice, which is that patients treat while pain is mild. And if you treat while pain is mild, as you can see here, you double the pain-free response rate. So whenever you're prescribing one of these medications or any acute medication, it's always important to the extent possible that patients treat as soon as possible while pain is mild. And these drugs appear to be very favorably tolerated. So nausea and dizziness were reported in about 2% in about of patients. It, I'm giving you now some real world experience in the 106 patients that we looked at who we first treated with Ubrojapant. Not that it's real world because Mayo Clinic is probably not the real world, um, but we actually looked to see how effective these drugs were in our patients. Now, you must recognize that our patients are not like the patients that were studied in clinical trials. All the patients in clinical trials had episodic migraine. 95% of the patients in, our, in this study had chronic migraine. 
Nevertheless, we were really interested to know the consistency of effect. And I've highlighted here that the proportion of patients who had relief of pain two hours after taking ubrojapant, 100% of the time, because patients really need to rely on the medication from attack to attack. It was about a third. And so not surprisingly, when we asked patients if they were dissatisfied or very satisfied, we used a Likert scale. Um, about a third rep reported that they were very satisfied. So it's not surprising that if you get relief of pain every time you use it within two hours, you're probably going to be very satisfied. What we found is that there were more side effects in, in our patient population than were seen in clinical trials. And this may be due to the patient population, the concomitant drugs they were taking, the comorbid diseases, or it's just that we collect side effects differently in practice. But we've certainly seen side effects that occurred at a higher rate in clinical practice than we see in clinical trials. But I think that's the same across the board, actually, for the, both the antibodies as well as these small molecule drugs. One thing I do want to mention is that we wondered whether giving a CGRP receptor antagonist like ubrojapant to a patient already on a monoclonal antibody that blocks the CGRP pathway, would it be effective? And in fact, we found that ubrojapant was significantly more likely to be effective if the patient was on an antibody and responding to an antibody, uh, which, is a very, which is very interesting. Of course, this is preliminary data. It's unpublished yet. It will have to be peer reviewed um, and confirmed, but it's very interesting that patients who are actually responding to antibodies respond even better to the, to the GPANs. Now this is Remegipant, which is the other GPANT that's been approved now, two pivotal phase three studies. And if you look at the data, it looks exactly the same pretty much. 20% pain-free, around 60% relief of pain, and then 2% had nausea or dizziness. So almost identical really to what we saw with Ubrojapant. The difference here for Remegipant is that recently it was reported to be effective for prevention. So now we have antibodies for prevention and probably soon we're gonna have drugs that are given every other day or every day that block CGRP for prevention. Now this is unpublished data. I took this from really the press release for Remegipant. This is the prophylactic study where it was given every other day. And I've highlighted here the responder rate at about 49%. Similar or in the range of what we saw with the antibodies and similar or in the range of what we see with topiramate, for example, or botulinum toxin in the chronic migraine population. Again, pretty well tolerated here. You can see the dropout due to AEs, less than 2%, and nausea occurred in about uh, 3% in the active group compared to 0.8 in the placebo group. So nausea appears to be reproducibly uh, the more common side effect with, with the GPANs. I mentioned one other GPANT that's in development now, Atojapant. So Atojapant is being developed not for the acute treatment of migraine, but for the preventive treatment of migraine. And this is a phase 2B, phase 3 trial that's now been published in The Lancet just a couple of months ago, showing that the responder rate for the BID dosing of Atojapant was about 58 to 62 percent. So pretty robust responder rate. Those are the proportion of patients who had a greater than 50 percent reduction. And again, if you look at the side effects, we're seeing a theme emerging here, aren't we? We're seeing nausea that seems to be dose dependent, up to 10 percent in the highest dose group. We're seeing constipation around six and a half, seven percent in the highest dose group. And we're seeing fatigue uh, about 10 percent. Fatigue has been um, the more common side effect for me, actually, in my patient population. I've actually had to stop the medication more for fatigue than I have for constipation and nausea combined, to be quite honest with you. And that goes for both the antibodies as well as the receptor antagonists. This is an unpublished study, but it was a recently reported completion of another phase three trial for Atojapant showing responder rates. Now this is single dosing of 10 milligrams, 30 milligrams, and 60 milligrams of Atojapant. And you can see 56 to 61% responder rates. And again, constipation and nausea being the most common side effects. In this 30 to 60 milligram dose groups, all of the secondary endpoints were met. So it's very likely that um, we're going to see both Remegipant and Atojapant be approved for the preventive treatment of migraines. So we'll have uh, tablets that patients can take for prevention that block CGRP, or we'll have antibodies that patients can inject monthly or quarterly 
uh, for prevention. It's really going to come down to a number of different factors as to which ones patients will select. And I can think of reasons why patients would select a tablet and reasons why patients would select uh, an antibody. So in summary then, GPANs are effective for the acute and preventive treatment of migraine. They're actually the first acute treatment where they, they don't have the potential to potentiate the risk for medication overuse headache. We have an animal model here in, in Frank Pareka's lab here at Mayo Clinic uh, for medication overuse headache. And regardless of what drug we put into that model, triptans, opioids, analgesics, uh, now lismitidan, we see the potential for these drugs if they're overused to pr produce, at least in a preclinical model, medication overuse headache or rebound. This is the first acute drug that doesn't is it, that, that isn't positive in this animal model. And of course, from the preventive studies that I showed you, you can use it every day or every other day uh, with a tojapan, remedjapan, and it actually reduces the frequency over time. So it's the first acute drug that doesn't potentiate the, the, the risk of rebound. It's more likely to be effective when pain is mild. It is effective in patients who have failed to respond to triptans. I didn't show you that data in the interest of time, but um, that data exists at least in a post hoc way. It, they're generally well tolerated with nausea, constipation, and fatigue being present anywhere between two to 6%, depending on whether it's an acute or prophylactic use. And it's not, they're not contrary in patients with cardiovascular disease. And in fact, in the antibody trials, for example, patients who had had a previous MI or stroke were allowed into the trial as long as it didn't occur within the previous six months. So that's important to note. And then I'll say just a few final words about lesmitidan, which is the other new acute therapy that was approved here in the United States. You know that historically, as I alluded to in my introductory comments, migraine was thought to be a vascular headache disorder due to the abnormal distension or dilation of blood vessels. And so triptans and were developed specifically to target a selective serotonin receptor on blood vessels that constricted um, the, the vessel, as opposed to ergots, which bind to dopamine and, and norepinephrine receptors, and, and as opposed to a serotonin, which binds to a whole family of serotonin receptors. So when triptans were developed, they agonized the 1B receptor, B for blood vessel, and constricted the vessel. They also bound, however, to 1D and 1F receptors, which are present on nerves and nerve terminals. And so the hunt then became, the hunt was on for a drug that could perhaps attach to the 1D or the 1F receptor alone, without binding to the 1B receptor on blood vessel and therefore remove that liability of constricting vessels and potentially removing the contraindication to using the drug in patients with risk factors or established cardiovascular disease. So the hunt was on. Pat Humphrey, I have his picture here because when he worked for GlaxoSmithKline, he really led the charge and is responsible for the development of the triptans. And at the time, you know, Pat used to talk about the triptans being cerebroselective because there were so many more 1D receptors on cerebral blood vessels than there were on coronary blood vessels, which is true. But nevertheless, there's enough 1B receptors on coronary vessels and on other vascular beds that we had some concern, of course, and that's why they're contraindicated. So the hunt for the 1F receptor antagonist ended with lesmitidan. And as you can see here in some experimental work that was done, the blue curve represents sumatriptan. On the left, it's the degree, the degree to which it constricts proximal coronary arteries, and on the right, the degree to which it constricts distal coronary arteries. And you can see that the gray bar, which is clinically um, clinical concentrations, you can see that sumatriptan does indeed constrict the proximal and the distal coronary arteries at clinically effective dosages. But in pink, which is lismitidan, there's absolutely no constriction of proximal or distal coronary arteries, which is not surprising, of course, because there's no 1F receptors on blood vessels. And I'm just showing you top line data now from the Samurai and the Spartan trials, two pivotal phase three trials that evaluated the efficacy and tolerability of lismitidan. And you can see, you know, pain-free rates around 32%, and uh, 38%. So very similar to what we see with the most effective triptan. So the take home message is that lismitidan has triptan-like um, efficacy.
However, because 1F receptors are distributed throughout the brain, including the vestibular cortex and other cortical regions, as well as subcortical regions, and because this drug penetrates the blood-brain barrier, um, you can see that the, the side effect profile is quite different than I showed you with the G-Pants. So there's quite a few CNS side effects, at least from the clinical trials. We see dizziness, paresthesia, somnolence, fatigue, lethargy, so much so that the DEA, this drug was delayed in its release because the DEA was looking at the extent to which it impaired consciousness or alertness. And in fact, now in the United States, it was approved, but one can't operate a motor vehicle for up to eight hours after taking the drug because it produced sort of sedative side effects similar to what you might see with a, uh, a dose of lorazepam, for example. So effective, um, great for patients who have cardiovascular contraindications to the use of triptans or who don't respond to G-pans, um, but one needs, to be, one needs to caution patients about this driving restriction and one needs to watch carefully for uh, this side effect profile. Now, just one final word about pay cap. So, you know, here is a, just a, an illustration of a trigeminal nerve fiber releasing some neuropeptides uh, at the level of the dura mater and, and the blood vessel. CGRP, we've talked a lot about, but PCAP38 is another neuropeptide located in the trigeminal sensory system that is released during migraine attacks. Um, that is, you can trigger a migraine attack by infusing PCAP, just as you can with CGRP, in fact, even more reliably. And when you treat, effectively treat a migraine attack, like CGRP, pay cap levels return to normal. So there's every bit the circumstantial evidence to support pay cap as a high value target as there is CGRP. And so of course, now a couple of biologics have been developed that target the pay cap receptor or that target the pay cap peptide itself. Now here I'm showing you the receptors for pay cap. Unlike CGRP, uh, PCAP binds to multiple different receptors. It binds to a PAC1 receptor, but it also binds to these VPAC receptors. So it has three different receptors that it binds to. So if you block the PAC1 receptor, as this biologic tried to do, AMG301, it was a biologic produced by Amgen, um, it showed no efficacy. So there was absolutely no difference compared to placebo. So unfortunately, that biologic failed. But there's another biologic in development right now, ALD1910, or since Alder was acquired by Lundbeck, it's become, it's got another name now. But it is a, a biologic or a monoclonal antibody that targets PCAP itself. So one might think that if you bound the PCAP peptide, you, you, you preclude its ability to bind to both the VPAC receptors as well as the PAC1 receptor. And so there's the potential that binding PCAP itself rather than the PAC1 receptor in isolation may prove to be more effective. And time will tell, of course, whether that's indeed the case. So in closing, why did I say it's been a gold rush for patients and, and of drugs and a heyday for patients? Uh, because we're basically able to help many more patients with an unmet treatment need uh, than, than than we were able to do before. There's no question that these medications in our hands, in our practice, and in our patients that look very much different than the clinical trial patients, they're, they're, they, the, the efficacy looks very similar. So we're able to help many more patients, not all of them, and there's still a serious unmet need and a substantial number of them, but we're able to help more patients, and that's fantastic. These are mechanism-based and disease-specific. So these biologics and these drugs have been developed to treat migraine. And not until the triptans really uh, was this the case. So these are mechanism-based and disease-specific and they're non-vascular. So we've moved away from the blood vessel and we're targeting now the trigeminal sensory nerve or indeed central trigeminal pathway. So we've moved away from the blood vessel and we know enough about the biology of this disease now to develop biologics that are, have high specificity for certain neuropeptides or their receptors. What that's done is it's, I think, reduced the stigma associated with these disease and the stigma that these patients often experience. Because if we know enough about the anatomy and the molecular biology of this disease to developing such highly specific and potent mechanism-based and disease-specific therapies, this is no longer the psychosomatic illness that many 
um, in the healthcare profession used to think migraine was. So I think it's gone a long way to legitimizing the biology of this disease and in reducing the stigma. I also think it's attracting more interest amongst neurologists, uh, pain physicians, and other primary care doctors. And it's interesting, it's, it's attracting more people into the field to do fellowship training, uh, and it's attracting more people in the laboratory to do more science uh, and research in migraine. So I think that's a fantastic thing for the field. When, when you can attract more clinicians and more scientists uh, to the field, I think that's for the betterment of the patients. And I think just as what happened with triptans, you know, I, I told you about how triptans, once we knew more about the receptor pharmacology of triptans, we're able then to have new targets like the 1F receptor, and hence we have a new drug in lismitidine. And I think equally here, we're going to learn more about, these drugs are going to teach, teach us more about the biology of this disease, and they're going, it's going to tee up new targets for therapy. So I think these drugs, yes, they've helped a lot of patients, but I, ultimately I think, as is inevitably the case, it will lead to more therapeutic advances. So that's it for my uh, presentation. I, I really want to thank you very much the organizers for the invitation. It's, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have been invited and an honor to have had the opportunity to give this presentation. And as a young kid growing up in Cape Breton who always wanted to visit Banff and Lake Louise, um, this is not the way I pictured visiting Banff and Lake Louise, but uh, make no mistake, it's going to be first on my list uh, when this pandemic ends and, and we're able to travel. Thank you so much.